How's it going, my fellow history scholars? Welcome to the podcast where we talk about the unanswered questions of history and unravel the many mysteries about our past. I'm your host today and uh, welcome our co-host Ian. Ian, you want to say hi? How's it going, everybody? And uh, welcome our special guest star today, Jeff Freeman, host of the Curse of Oak Island live stream podcast. And uh, thanks for joining us today, Jeff. Oh, great to be here. Thanks. All right, today we're gonna to be talking about Oak Island, its history and the many theories surrounding the origin of its mysterious treasure. And uh, we'll begin with a little background here on what the treasure is. So uh, for those of people that don't know what Oak Island is, uh, Jeff, would you wanna give a brief background about the Oak Island mystery? Mm -hmm. yeah, actually, uh, Oak Island is an island that is in the Mahone Bay uh, up in uh, Nova Scotia. Um, and it's an island that has had a treasure hunt going on for over 200 years. Um, it was basically started by, they say on the show, three young boys. Um, and that would be um, uh, Vaughn and Smith. And um, anyway, so they said they, these three young boys found, uh, got over to the island and they found a depression in the ground and, a, and an oak tree overhead. Um, and then they found like a, some markings in the tree that looked like a pulley or some sort of thing was it mounted in the tree. Well, Come to find out that a lot of that story that you hear on the show is not exactly the way it went down. Um, actually, they weren't boys. They were young men. They were in their 30s because they actually served in the uh, this, uh, Revolutionary War. Um, and then they made their way up into Nova Scotia from there. Um, they did come across the island. They did find, they started digging into this depression in the ground that they found. Um, and they found that every 10 feet, there was a layer of, of clay and then a layer of logs, oak logs going across. And this was at every 10 foot level. And they continued down um, and they got down to uh, eventually, uh, this went on for a while, um, that they eventually got down to the 90 foot level and they found what's called the 90 foot stone. Uh, and this is when they actually formed a company. I think it was called the Truo, Truo Company. Um, and uh, supposedly they found something. They found a few artifacts. Um, there has been rumors to say that they actually found uh, some some treasure. Uh, that's where it all started. Basically, that's where it started. And they they got down, and then the they, they flood tunnels uh, took over, and flooded the entire uh, area that was that they were digging down. Everything got flooded, and then they halted their search from that point forward. And then over the years, over the course of this 220 years or so, um, many other people have attempted to they have bought land on the island and they have attempted to find this treasure um and this has gone on for like i said over 220 years and has gotten to the point where the it's cost an awful lot of money so at some point you have to figure you know how much money are they going to spend and are they ever going to find what they're looking for um but there's a lot of history involved uh as to who's been on the island so this that's where it got started looking for treasure um, and now, now it's kind of evolved into the fact that there is a lot of history that may change the history books about who's been, you know, who discovered North America. You know, our history books tell us that uh, Christopher Columbus uh, discovered America, but we know that that's not exactly true. Yes, he did come over and he was one of the first established um, that came over to do things, but there have been a lot of others that have come before them um and many believe that the the templars have been over that many believe that the um the norsemen who were, were the original vikings have been over to north america and um and portugal uh folks in portugal we know the french the english have been in in on uh, oak island um there's evidence of that uh in and also well nova scotia is um new scotland is the name that's what nova scotia means um uh, is new scotland so we know the scots have been over so that's where the history comes into play, um, that there's a lot of, of history here to be learned um, and, and needs to be proven. And there's a lot of researchers that are looking into the, doing just that to try to prove who's been here, when, and what were they doing on Oak Island? Right. There's all these different fascinating theories about all these different groups of people that may or may not have been on this island. And it makes you think, uh, what's the reason? What's the mystery behind this? And uh, that's a lot of what we're going to get into today. Mm-hmm. So uh, the first one we're going to get into is a theory concerning Captain Kidd and the idea that Captain Kidd could have been on the island. So uh, this is coming from the Oak Island Treasures.co.uk 
website and uh, what they had to say about the Captain Kidd theory is that stories had been in existence since the 1600s that Captain William Kidd had buried a hoard of treasure to be found on an island east of Boston. Legend told of a dying sailor in the New England colonies who confessed to being a part of Kidd's notorious crew, but he never named an exact location for the hidden booty. Rich New Jersey businessman Gilbert Hedden, who is right there on that slide, made a link between the money pit and pirates when exploring the island in 1936. He discovered a large triangle of beach stones laid out in the shape of a rough sextant, which pointed to the direct or which pointed to the direction of the pit. Fascinated by his fine head and research pirate activity in the Nova Scotia area and using charts printed in a book by Harold Willings entitled Captain Kidd and a Skeleton Island, he continued his research. So that's the book right there. And what I find interesting is that uh, if you look at some of the ads and stuff that they use for the Oak Island show, it's actually, um, if we can go back to slide one, that's the the island right there based off the, the book by mm -hmm. Harold T. Willings. Yep. So that's interesting. <clears throat> So what what do you think as far as the Captain Kid theory? Um, Captain Kid, I, I think he uh, well, first of all, I do believe that there there have been pirates. There's well, it's well documented there have been pirates up in that area. Um, one thing that they have talked about, uh, and this has also been documented up in the um, in the Canadian archives, is that where it is uh, positioned in Mahone Bay, there is a it's a good uh, place to shelter and also to hide. If you're looking to hide, you can actually come in behind Oak Island, between Oak Island and the mainland and Mahone Bay there, and you can actually, you know, anchor your ships there and be protected from storms behind the island. Um, so we know that there has been um, pirates up in there. That's well documented. And also we know that uh, James Anderson um, has been on, you know, he owned property on the island. I think he owned Lot 26 at one time, and he was a privateer, uh, if you want to call up a, a, a pirate a privateer. Um so we know that that's true. Now, Captain Kidd, I don't know. I don't have a lot of information on that particular uh, theory, but um, it was talked about that, yes, he was one of the people that were on Oak Island over the years, but I don't have much information on him. Uh, whereas with James Anderson, we do because he actually owned he actually owned property on the island. Right, and I think it's interesting you mentioned James Anderson because, yeah, what's the – there's a very fine line between a privateer and pirate. Uh, yeah, privateer exactly. is basically the legal version of a pirate. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. We, right, yeah. right. So we do have uh, the presence of pirates or privateers, like you mm -hmm. said, on the island, and uh, I believe that they've even found a uh, oak logs and stuff that may or may not be part of uh, a possible shipwreck in the area, and a uh, uh, yep. huge anomaly in the swamp that uh, we'll get into. In a little bit but the next pirate uh, i want to get into uh, as we're talking about pirate theories is uh well there's the stone triangle right there that mm -hmm. they talked about in the book but the next pirate i want to get into is uh sir francis drake or technically uh, a privateer for the, the english armada mm -hmm. and so yeah sorry are you gonna say something? oh no go ahead so uh th this one's coming from uh the History Channel, and uh, they did an uh, article about the Curse of Oak Island, and uh, this is what they had to say about the Sir Francis Drake theory. Uh, Sir Francis Drake was an English explorer, sea captain, slave trader, privateer, naval officer, and politician. Drake's best known for his circumnavigation of the world in a single expedition from 1577 to 1580. In Season 5, Episode 7, The Lot Thickens, historian Paul Speed suggests that a scrap of leather purportedly used in the bookbinding process is tied to the 16th century privateer and his looting of hundreds of millions of dollars worth of treasure from a Spanish galleon. This theory further suggests that Drake himself is buried on the island because when you hit metal, you might have hit the coffin, says Speed. Yeah, that's pretty interesting um, in that in that article there. Um, whether or not his, his body is buried there, we don't know. But I know that there is some interesting things that they have brought up from, um, I think this was the spoils from H8. This was one of the caissons they put down in what they call the money pit area. And they brought up some leather... Uh, that they they attributed and they weren't sure exactly what it was at first so they took the leather over and they showed it to um, an expert that works with leather and book bindings and stuff they were thinking that it had something to do with book binding well it turns out that it was actually leather from a shoe um, now this this was in the spoils uh, probably of over 100 feet underground 
um, where it was brought up, and they found it on the wash table as they were going through those spoils. Um, this particular shoe, piece of the shoe, uh, was very prominent, but they also determined by the stitching that was used in it that it was not a common worker's shoe. This would have been somebody of a higher level uh, shoe that, uh, you know, somebody with more money or a higher position, like a captain or somebody of, you know, more noble uh, descent um, that this shoe belonged to. So, you know, and some of the people are saying, well, that could have been Francis Drake. You know, maybe if he was buried there or something, uh, that might be part of his shoe that they found. It could be, but they have, and they have had a couple of bone fragments, but uh, those bone fragments... Um, haven't really, uh, you know, you can't really determine. They could, they could determine what uh, in, in nationality through the DNA testing, but uh, not so much to actually tell you, uh, you know, uh, and it's two different people and they were just small pieces of bone. So if somebody would have been buried down there, you wouldn't bury somebody 100 and some feet underground. You'd bury them eight feet underground to 10 at the most. Um, and generally in those days, you'd be in six would be a stretch. Um so it's very hard to say that anybody, there's been no record of any burial of any bodies ever found on Oak Island. So I don't know if that would be the case. Um, well, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but did they find a, a presence of lead on the island? And, like in relation to the lead coffin? Um, let's see. There has been some, yeah, there's been some mineral, I believe, that they found. <clears throat> a little bit of... Um, mineral that found in water that would lead to some lead and there was also some lead uh in the swamp area um that was found and again it was in water samples if i remember correctly um so and there, there was also some mercury uh which is kind of interesting because if you talk about some of the writings of uh you know like shakespeare or something like that that there was a there was a, a theorist that was talking about the writings of shakespeare being on the island that they were, would have encased those in a box a lead box maybe a box lined with lead and then use also mercury in there to keep it safe and not let any kind of uh you know liquids or anything get into it and, and keep it from de uh, degrading over years um that way you keep manuscripts and things of that nature a long period of time so uh but yeah in the swamp i believe there has been some lead found in uh you know mineral in the water you know, for sure I'm pretty sure that was the case that they did find that before, but there has definitely been some lead artifacts found. Of course, the cross, the lead cross, and some lead strips of uh, uh, little pieces of strips of lead uh, that they have definitely found there. So it's definitely present. Yeah, I find that interesting. And I wanted to bring up this slide because uh, this one shows the the Spanish eight coin that they found. Mm -hmm. uh, if mm -hmm. Sir Francis Drake was the one that was taking down all these Spanish galleons for the English Armada. It, it's very possible that if he was on the island, he could have left one of these behind, if not the whole horde that he had taken. Right. Um, yeah, it's a possibility for sure. And so, like, getting more into the idea of uh, private pri pirates and privateers being on the island, uh, we have this anomaly in the swamp mm -hmm. with uh, with a sunken shipwreck is and the Spanish coin, like I was saying. Right. But, yeah, that, uh, was, that was uh, that was Tom Nolan. Uh, Tom Nolan uh, owned property. Uh, he was there doing his uh, treasure hunting at the same time that Dan Blankenship was, uh, which would have been in the seventies. <clears throat> and Tom Nolan ended up buying some. Uh, I'm yeah, I'm sorry, Fred Nolan ended up buying some property, and uh, he was starting this. And he owned the swamp. That part of his property that he owned was included the swamp in it. Now his theory was that the swamp uh, was actually. It, actually an area of water that was between two islands. So his theory was that there was actually two mm -hmm. islands, the eastern part of the island and the western part, and that the water went through, which is now where the swamp is. They, his theory was that they, and he was finding evidence of wood scuppers and different pieces of what he was saying was ship, ship, you know, wood from a ship. Um, though he, his determination was that there was actually a ship that had brought, been brought into the swamp when it was open water, and then either burned or sunk at that point, you know, flipped over on its side and sunk and then covered up with dirt uh, and made then making the, the swamp because it's still right at just a little bit above sea level. And so it makes this uh, swampy area where the water keeps coming in from the ocean and stuff during storms. And again, you get this uh, the swamp there. But um, and this anomaly that you're showing right here in this picture 
when you measure it out to be 200 feet long, 440 feet wide and about uh, and on one end, which would be the stern, and then the bow being about 25 right. feet wide, it does look like a anomaly of a, a ship over flipped over on its side. It really does. Um, what's interesting about that, because they went out and they went out in the swamp and they were doing some, uh, they were doing some, uh, putting in some, well, with their wells is what they do. They call it a borehole. <clears throat> it's actually a well drilling company that goes out there and does this. And they, they went out there and they poked some holes down into the area where this anomaly was. They were looking for wood fragments or something to come up and they did not find any. And so they concluded, okay, it's just a, it's just a raised part of the dirt or it's anomaly of dirt or something underground. It's not really a ship. Well, that carried for a long time, even though uh, Marty believed that, uh, that it was nothing there to be found. And then Rick uh, still believes that something that Swamp holds secrets. This year, right toward the end of the season here, just what, two episodes ago, <clears throat> they found, they were digging down there where on the end where it shows that 40 foot. Um, if you look in the one picture you're showing there where it shows a seismic anomaly on the very south end of that, uh, yeah, down in that in area there, they were doing some digging uh, with the excavator, uh, and they actually hit some timbers down there. And they brought up a piece of wood that definitely looks like a piece of ship's railing, like a hand railing for a stairway going up to, say, like the capstan or something like that. It was very well uh, preserved because this uh, this swamp, the way the material, the muck, and everything that's in the swamp, it it, it preserves the wood very well. So it was very well preserved, and, and it was routed ends, and it's just the shape of it and everything, it was definitely a piece of like a ship's railing. So they found that first. They kept looking, and then they started scraping along a large beam down there. And that would have been right off the end where that 40, where it says 40 foot there. Um, they, they scraped along the edge of a beam. Now they're saying, you know, we've definitely got something here that we need to take a look at. Unfortunately, the weather was coming in and the season was uh, over pretty much for their searching. So they put this off until this year to uh, in 2021 to actually start excavating that area and find out is that really the, the is that the stern of the ship that they hit right there or parts of it. So we have yet to see what's going to come of that. So right. Fred Nolan was right all along. And uh, I'm I'm trying to find it here. Uh, this might be a picture, but I want to share because I think it was a a while ago that they were, they had a diver in one of the early seasons. Mm -hmm. Tony uh, Stinson. Mm -hmm. Right there. I don't know if that shows it, but didn't he find a, a, an oak log that might be the dimensions? He found, of he found a large piece of plankton. Um, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's Tony Sampson there. He's in the he's in the water. He's one of the he's their main diver, uh, or I should say one of their main divers. Him and John Chatterton, um, but he right. found yeah he was in the swamp there and he actually found a piece of uh, planking and I'm going to call it planking because it was like a piece of one by material or one and a one and a half inch thick, and it was uh, about 17 feet long, um, and that was very unusual. Why would this big big piece of planking be in in the swamp? Um, now you could say yes, it floated in from over. You know, the if before that road was there, they they've got the road going across the bottom of the swamp. Now that was man-made. Uh, before that was there, water would wash up into the uh, um, wash up into the uh, the swamp area there from the ocean. Um, and something, yes, something could have floated in over the years. A piece of wood. That's hard to say that that wouldn't have um, floated in and just sunk down and ended up on the floor of the swamp, and then. And then Tony found it. But it's interesting to note that it is a piece of what looks like a piece of of ship planking. Um, definitely a piece of wood that looks like it's about, uh, oh, I think I think it was about six to seven inches um, wide and then about uh, 17 feet long and about an inch, a little over an inch thick. So uh, certainly looked like a piece of um, decking or a, some sort of a piece of uh, material like that. Now, whether that means that there's a ship in the swamp or not can't be determined, but certainly interesting nonetheless. Yeah, for sure. So uh, after that, uh, it, around the same same time frame, not a, not as much privates and privateers, uh, we get into uh, the the Marie Antoinette theory, which mm -hmm. uh, I find very interesting because uh, actually uh, one of our past presidents, FDR, 
uh, believed mm-hmm. that that the Oak Island mystery was to be solved, that it had something to do with uh, Marie Antoinette theory. Right. Yeah. When she was in fear of uh, being beheaded, um, she had one of her um, uh, handmaids uh, take her jewels that she had um, that were very uh, heirlooms and whatnot that she had uh, and gave them to her and told her to go and stash these away, get them away from here somewhere. And so there was a theory that 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 lady made her way over on a ship or her uh, entourage that she was with. I got onto a ship and then made their way over to the new world um, that they had found at that time, which was, would have been, you know, Nova Scotia Um, and Nova Scotia being, you know, new Scotland Um, and Acadia was actually called Arcadia or Acadia um, prior to that. And um, so, yeah, so she would have escaped and that the theory is that she brought those jewels with her. Um, the family heirlooms and jewels that she brought with her, and she brought them over to the New World to be buried on the island uh, and be hidden away so that nobody could find them. So that's one of the theories there, too. And FDR, uh, as a young man, uh, was on the island, and he was actually, uh, he's actually a Mason, um, and he was part of... Um, uh, Charles, right? Or Yeah, well, his father was also uh, involved, I guess, had known about more. That's where he actually got the more of the story um was from his father and i guess the family knew about some history of um possible treasure on oak island and so that's when he got involved in it uh and he went up and uh was looking to see what he could find uh in his younger years he was actually part of the uh there's another team of uh, researchers at that time they they they, they, they changed hands over these 200 years all these different people that companies i should say that have been looking for the treasure on the island and uh, I don't, I don't know if I hold a lot of uh, water on the whole Anto- uh, Marie Antoinette theory. Um, it's kind of a stretch, but the the problem with it is, is there's really nothing to tie it together. If you if you have a good theory, you need to have some types of of documentation or some types of pieces of evidence to lead you to that theory. And that one doesn't really have much to it. It's a great idea but there's really no evidence to support it unfortunately uh where she would have ended up with those now that the part that she did run off with some of that because that you know that some of those uh jewels and whatnot are still haven't been found so that they're somewhere but whether or not they're on oak island i i don't know but there's really no not a lot of supporting evidence for that unfortunately right uh i, I did want to mention that the picture here is of uh fort Louisburg. And uh, I believe you did an episode before this and uh, you had some researchers on and they were talking about this fort. Yeah, there's some interesting aspects to this. <clears throat> and um, that they that we know that the, the French and the British, mo- mostly the French, they had a, they had quite a few um, in, encampments, military encampments on the island uh, or not. I should say in Nova Scotia, um, not necessarily on the island, but they were on Oak Island. And so that and, and the fact that. Uh, Nova Scotia changed hands between all these different people over the years. The French were there, and then the British came and kicked them out, and then the French came and kicked them out. So it went back and forth and back and forth quite a bit. Um, and why, you know, you wonder why. Why was that so important? Why was this area st- so strategic to them? Um, one thing was is that it was a, it was a good stopping point. Uh, when they were coming over across the ocean, um, they make their way over. That's one of the closest points to get to. Um, and also, when you look at the fact that there are, there. Well, were, right, it's right up there along the the northeastern coast. So right, exactly. That's uh, so it's a stopping point along the way. Exactly, yeah, it's a good place to stop and resupply and all that. And you can set up defenses like they've done here. Um, and there is some connections between some of the tunneling that they found at the at the fort, um, at, that that lead them to believe that if the tunneling was going on there then the tunneling on Oak Island could definitely be there as well. So there's, they're looking at that as, as, as evidence as well. Um, so, but we know, we know that the fact that there have been military, um, well, I say a fact, I, I don't know if it's actually been proven, but there's definitely been military presence of the British and the French, both on Oak Island at, at some point, because they found coins, they found uh, what looks like a, an encampment uh, of sorts, uh, definitely there. So it's pretty right. Amazing. And uh, Samuel Ball was supposedly uh, in the British Army, right? He was. Yeah, exactly. So we have he that was, as well. 
Yep, he was an escaped slave, and he made his way uh, up to. He, he was friends with um, Anthony uh, McG uh, Anthony McGinnis at the time. Uh, him and McGinnis had left um, Daniel McGinnis. I'm sorry, it was Daniel McGinnis and uh, Anthony Vaughn. Yeah, and Anthony Vaughn. Thank you. I was getting those mixed up. Um, but Daniel McGinnis definitely he knew Daniel McGinnis. It looks like they knew each other down in the South um, when Samuel Ball was a slave. Uh, Samuel Ball escaped at some point, uh, and he had heard that if you go and you fight for the British, um, that they will they will reward reward you in some way because they were going to win, of course, um, and that they were going to give you some sort of reward land or something like that, and you would gain your freedom. Um, so he did. So he went up and he fought, and so did uh, Daniel McGinnis. After that was completed, they made their way up to Nova Scotia, where they were given uh, Samuel Ball was. Um, and again, I don't have my notes here in front of me. To there was a there was a part of Nova Scotia where the um, where the uh, the black folks would have been taken to, and they were starting to give land and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, he he became very prosperous, and he bought part of Oak Island, and he actually bought his piece of land from James Anderson. So he owned that lot that James, he bought it from James Landers, Anderson and then became a very wealthy man. So they were kind of wondering why did uh, Samuel Ball become so wealthy? And he was actually starting to trade uh, on, you know, buying goods and, and services uh, from the mainland with, with silver and gold coins. Um, so that's always curious. It's like, wow, where did he come up with those at? But uh Right. So, so we know that the presence of the military has been there. And because in part of one of the, yeah, there's a picture of him there. <clears throat> well, supposedly it's an artist rendition of him. Of yeah, Sam I was trying to remember what lots he bought on the island. He ended up owning, I think, seven different lots at one time. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's a picture. Of, yeah. Right there is a, a picture you have. So it's uh, 24, 5, or 25, 6, and 7. And then he bought some that are over in the uh, the swamp area and then a couple right across from him. Um, on the north side, six, seven, and eight. So he ended up, yeah, he ended up owning most of that'd be nine lots at one time. Now, where did he get all the money from that? Supposedly he was right. just a simple cabbage farmer, you know, but all of a sudden he's one of the wealthiest men in all of Nova Scotia. Now, how did that come about? <laughs> so, you know, you think, well, Something swishy. he's, he's either selling golden cabbages <clears throat> or he's, uh, he's definitely come across some money somewhere. And the same thing happened with, there was another, Anthony Graves uh, is another gentleman that owned property. And he owned pretty much all the way across from like lot number four, all the way across the top of the island to um, Isaac's Point, which is on lot 20. It's the one, lot 20, all the way to the far right um, on the top. Yeah. So he owned from like lot five, all the way across to Isaac's Point. Um, now he was also known to be buying goods and services on the mainland with with gold and, and uh, silver Spanish coins. And again, you lead back to where did he find these? You know, and you had mentioned the pirates earlier. And one of my beliefs is that there have been depositors of some sorts of treasure or money or, or whatever, jewels and, and whatnot, from several different people over the years. I believe some of that may have been what these guys found because they didn't have the capability of digging down that far into the money pit to find some big treasure if it was some uh, religious artifacts. But now is a pirate going to dig? If you have a pirate that's going to hide some some treasure on an island, is he going to dig down 160 feet in the ground and hide it? No, probably not. Not likely. <laughs> not likely. He's going to bury it, you know, 15 feet, and then they're going to come back and dig it back up later and haul off with it. So he, they're not going to go much more than 15 feet underground. They're going to make it easy to get to so so that is what and we know that um that samuel ball was a farmer you know he did he was a cabbage farmer there's no doubt about that it's well documented so if he's over there and he's digging stumps and he's doing all this to make farmland he's likely more likely to find some kind of pirate treasure that would have been on the island versus finding some something that's buried 160 or 180 feet underground so Right. They didn't have the machines that we have today. And with You're the right, exactly. thoughts, they're not even able to look at every possible spot that they could right. without spending as much money as they, they have to. That, that, uh, Samuel Ball is a definitely uh, interesting character uh, in, in connection with this island. Um, there's not much. There's been no that we know of. There's been no pictures taken of him. 
Um, we know he's been there. There's well documented that he was there. There's deeds and everything. And what's interesting is to say that he was on, he actually lived on the island. Or, or let me sit, let me back that up. <clears throat> we don't know if he was living on the island, but he had owned a property on the island when the money pit was originally founded in 1795. He owned that property. He bought that property from James Anderson. James Anderson owned it in 1788. So, um, so he bought that property and he was living or had property on the island when the money pit was first discovered. Another interesting thing about him is that the first paperwork that was written about this discovery of the money pit, his name was on it. The three people that found it was Anthony Vaughn and Daniel McGinnis and Samuel Ball. And then all of a sudden his name mm -hmm. is taken off. And then there's another uh, book or, or something written, uh, some paperwork that's been documented up there in the historical archives that uh, his name is not on there. Now it's, it's Vaughn Smith and McGinnis and Ball's name is taken off. And so you wonder why, why was his name taken off when you know he owned property on the Island during that time. So another curious little tidbit and in his will, his will was read and he was friends with Vaughn and, and Daniel McGinnis. They all knew each other and it's well, they're part of his will. So they were all connected together. All those guys that uh, were the original um, discoverers of the money pit. So a lot of history there that needs to be, needs to be dug up. Yeah. Right. It's the victors who, who end up writing the story. So I find <laughs> yeah, exactly, it interesting. Yeah. They took his name off, took his name off of that list. Yep. For sure. And yeah, it's this enigma. Like if you're expecting this, uh, this African-American who's fought in the revolutionary war, who retires to live on his cabbage farm on the Island somehow is able to buy all this land. Uh, it's definitely mm -hmm. a yeah. big question is uh, how he was able to do that. Yeah. He became one of the, he became probably the most wealthy person in Nova Scotia at that time. How did he do that? He didn't do it by selling cabbages. I don't right. think, anyway. <laughs> Not likely. Not likely. All right. So the next one is uh, I'm going to stray a little bit, but uh, I want to get into the the Shakespeare theory. And uh, oh, okay. uh, a lot of this has to do with, uh, or at least uh, a person that I read up on, uh, Petter Amundsen. And I believe mm -hmm. that he was on some of the early episodes of uh, yeah, he of was. Oak Island. And, he was uh, season one, I believe. Yeah. And uh, his research is fascinating because he starts all the way from Europe and explains all the symbolism as to how exactly the Shakespeare and the Rosicrucians may have been connected to the island. Mm -hmm. so, and there's there's several people out there, uh, James McQuiston being one of them. Uh, he's another researcher. And um, these folks uh, are showing a lot of good information, including Peter uh, Peter Amundsen, um, that do not believe that Shakespeare was an actual character. A person right. um, that actually Francis Bacon was the writer of all the Shakespeare's um, manuscripts and uh, stories and everything like that. So, and they were doing it under a pen. He was doing it under a pen name, which was William Shakespeare. Now, was that true? We don't know for a fact, but it sure does lead to a lot of interesting. Um, if you if you really dig into it, like these researchers have it seems pretty evident that Shakespeare was a, a name that was from an actor, uh, a stage actor at one point that uh, Francis Bacon took that name and used it as his pen name to write his manuscripts. So that really he is the man behind the uh, Shakespeare. Um, now we know that uh, Sir Francis Bacon has uh, been around Nova Scotia uh, and possibly even Oak Island. Um, and there's many that believe that he maybe stashed many of these manuscripts and things that he had uh, on Oak Island. Um, so there's theories there. So that's a that's a very and that can go on for hours talking about uh, uh, this one here. The Shakespeare theory. I'm more inclined to believe um, that what the what like Petter uh, and uh, James McQuiston and uh, I'm just trying to think. There's another one actually too. Um, um, uh, Alessandra Nadavari, who was just on my uh, live show, just our live stream just a little bit ago, she, um, they are tied in with the Francis Bacon uh, really being uh, the, the writer behind uh, William Shakespeare and the fact that his manuscripts may very well be 
in Nova Scotia or maybe or will be on Oak Island or had been at one time. Um, so that's an, that's another, that, that, and that, like I said, that one can go on for hours because there's a lot of great information on that one. Um, and that's right. the one that I'm more led to believe in um, just simply because the facts do kind of lead or what they found do, does kind of lead towards Bacon being the man behind uh, the William Shakespeare um, writings and uh, manuscripts. Right. And uh, there was a documentary that they put out. Uh, I think it was Shakespeare, the hidden truth mm -hmm. or uh, yeah. Yeah. I believe it was that. And uh, I began watching that and uh, I, I saw the episode that they did with Peter Amundsen mm -hmm. and uh, I was very skeptical at first to, to say the least, but then mm -hmm. I, I, I watched that documentary and saw the research and uh, read the book that uh, that's on that slide there. Yep. And I was like, there might be something to this because there's so many, uh, interesting ties and connections and uh, uh, even the constellations that line up. Uh, I might be on this slide. The the constellation Cygnus that they believe has uh, a lot to do with uh, pointing towards Nolan's cross on the island. Yeah. There's a lot of very uh, specific stuff that uh, it's, it's hard to refute after you see how all the evidence begins to line up. Yeah, and that picture you're showing right there on the right side, um, and I forget what the name of that is. You might know it. Um, I think it's like College Fraternitas, which is on the, the banner. Yes, there. Yeah, right on the banner on the top there. Yeah, that that's interesting. And I've got uh, a guest coming on. Um, Jake Roberts is coming up later in May, uh, the, in the, on the 22nd of May. And I'm going to be talking to him. And he is one of these people who can decode all these things. Um, and he's going to be talking about that particular uh, drawing that you have right there. And uh, that's that'll be one of the things he's going to be discussing. Um and that's that's and it, this kind of stuff here when they get going on this and they show all the encoding there's so much code um written into these things and they did that for a couple of different reasons one was because that was considered heretical you know or, or you were a heretic Heretical, right you know yeah if you were making these drawings and you were trying to say that you know god did this or you know the you know whatever you know noah's you can see noah's ark is in the background back there yeah right there on the corner um, so, you know, if you were to that, and that's why they used, you know, for Sir Francis Bacon would have used the name Shakespeare to begin with. So to hide who he really was, who was really doing these writings. So they did a lot of encoding because they were not only hiding things, but they were leaving it for someone else to decipher later to, to come across with some answers. And that's, um, that, that takes a special mind to go through these things and find all these little clues that are and this this is this picture here just is mind blowing because there's there's got to be two hundred different clues in this. In that there's one. so <laughs> many symbols in it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so how you can uh, how somebody can take and sit down and figure all that out? I really don't. I, I don't get it. It's uh, it's fascinating. Well, it's yeah. such an easy way to encode something that you want to hide because if only a select group of people know exactly what all the symbols mean, then exactly. it's a very easy way to uh, make it a language that you only want certain ears to hear. Exactly. Yep. And uh, I, you can see if your, your researcher has something to say about it. But what I found interesting is if you see the star up here in the goose, mm -hmm. that's the same constellation that we see right here with the star yep. and the goose. Yep. So I wonder if those two have a connection and... Uh, that's supposed to be points to Nolan's cross. So yeah, I, and I, find I think that Nolan's cross. I'm I'm on board with believing that Nolan's cross is significant in this story uh, of what's what has happened on Oak Island. You know, one of the things that uh, you know that uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rick Lagina, you'll hear him say quite a few times on the show, it's the who, what, why, when, and where of of Oak Island. Because you know, is there treasure still on Oak Island? Don't know. I, I'm one of those that believe that maybe not. They might find some traces of it, but whether or not there's actual treasure still on Oak Island, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards no, but there's history there. And that's what you you guys are all about is the, uh, you know, history's um, mysteries. And that's something that we we want to know who's been on Oak Island, when they were there, and what what were they doing there? Um, and when you look at the fact that there was there's absolute evidence to show that there was people digging tunnels underground on this little tiny island, 150 feet, 180 feet underground. What in the world were they doing down there? There's chambers down there that's already been discovered. They're trying to nail down exactly where the money pit is right now, but there's actual chambers down there. So what in the world was going on? 
what were they doing down there? That's the, and there's and who's there? Who's all these people that have been there? Uh, and it could change American history. Really, it could. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I find it interesting. And then I'll do one more connection with the the Rosicrucian and Shakespeare theory. And then uh, I'll let Ian take over a little bit because he's been kind of quiet there on the sidelines. <laughs> yeah, and I've got to get going here pretty soon too, guys. I got I got uh, a little limited on time. That's all good. Uh, but I did want to get into, uh, we were talking about Nolan's cross. Uh, mm -hmm. They also connect this with the menorah, which you see in the carving right there. Right. And that maybe the, the Rosicrucians and uh, if they were connected to the Templars, because there's been some ties between the two, mainly because they're both mystical orders and share some common symbols. But right. what I find interesting is uh, there's a very prominent symbol that Nolan's cross may line up with, and that's the the tree of life, the tree of life. Yep, exactly. And the mercy which is mm -hmm. right. The mercy seat and the mercy stone, which I believe is on Oak Island as well, right. or at least Peter, Peter Munson believed in. Right. Exactly. And uh, the tree of life is a very prominent Templar and, uh, and Rosicrucian symbol. And if we're to believe that, uh, uh, Francis Bacon was the real author behind the, the Shakespeare mm -hmm. manuscripts. And yep. it would make sense why a lot of the symbolism is, is tied in. Yep. Exactly. Right. Yeah, then that's that, and 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 like you said, Petter was very on board with all of this right here, and that, and listening to him, and we will have him on. Uh, he'd be a good one to have on your show. <laughs> I would love <laughs> to, to talk to him. Yeah, I'd reach out to him. I'm serious. He, he'd probably come on um, because they love having a forum to discuss this stuff. And uh, but he he has a lot of good information about this, and and his his description of what's happening with this uh, the possible tree of life laid out on Nolan's cross. Uh, does hold some some water. They have found. He went out on the island, and they were looking for some of the other points. Now they had the five the five stones that they call cones um, of the the what what uh, Fred Nolan found that make up the cross. Um, now Petter went out, and he was looking at some of the other points, like the Mercy Point and that. And they went out and found that there were indeed some stones out there that that apparently. Um, I don't know that if uh, Fred Nolan ever found them or not, or he didn't document them as being part of this, um, because I don't know if he knew about the, you know, how much he knew about the tree of life. Um, so, you know, when they went out and looked for some of these other stones, they did find some in that in those areas of those other points. So is that, does that mean that um, they were really, that Nolan's cross really is, was laid out to be like the tree of life, like you have shown there? It's quite possible. Very right, and they're these. They're not these uh, small stones. They're, they're fairly large, if I'm if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. So yeah. it would they take quite the operation to be able to move these and put yeah. them in the specific places. Yeah, so it would have had to, a lot of manpower. Right. So if it was deliberate, it, it was it was put there for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the the five that they found that lay out the, that lay out Nolan's cross would not, and and they, they line up perfectly. Uh, when, when they've done, and Steve Guptill's been out there and he's done his uh, GPS marking of them, they're laid out perfectly. There's no, you know, you can't, it, stones don't lay out perfectly like that in a cross any other way, but other being placed there. So they were definitely placed there. Now, why? Why would that cross be on Nolan's or be on Oak Island? It has to mean something. Nobody's going to take the, go through all this effort to lay out those stones in the pattern of a cross just because, oh yeah, well, I, I like the pattern of a cross. So I'm going to go through all this effort and do this. So it means something. And again, we got to get down to the, the we got to, it's, this is a mystery. It's a historical mystery. We got to get that answer right. to. And the right, eye of the exactly. swamp was another one. Yeah. You know, you'd look at the eye of the swamp and the mis and the Masonic, you know, the Masonic, uh, the all seeing eye on top of the pyramid. You'd look at your dollar bill, look at the back of a dollar bill. What do you got? You got the pyramid with the all seeing eye on top of it. And when you lay that down over the swamp, you've got a triangle swamp with the eye of the swamp being right where the all seeing eye would be. It, it, it's got to mean something. It's not a coincidence. Right. So I'll let uh, Ian introduce our, our next theory. All right. All right. Sorry for staying so quiet, guys. There's just a batch of background noise and this is more Jake's uh, Jake's presentation than mine, but uh, on to the next theory, the star map theory. So this theory uh, from the History Channel, top 21 stories about, uh, it's top 21 theories about Oak Island in season six, episode seven, rock solid. Astrophysicist, Dr. Travis Taylor met with the team. 
Taylor believes that the symbols used by Freemasons, uh, as well as a map of the constellation Taurus overlaid onto a map of Oak Island, reveal that the treasure is on the western side of the island. A brief explanation to some locations suggested in Dr. Taylor's research failed to turn up anything conclusive. Uh, in Gretchen Cornwall website, Taylor noticed that there were high numbers of individuals involved in the Oak Island mystery over the years who were Freemasons. Mm -hmm. he, studied their, he studied their traditions, led him to conclude that the constellation Taurus may have been overlaid on the island as a star map using the principle as above, so below, in a literal sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's very true. And that's that's well that that whole item that you know you just said, or that phrase that you said, as it is above, so it is so below. below. Um, that's the, and that that could lead into something here. Now they they did check into this, and they they he would they did have uh, um, they did have uh, Travis on the show and explained all this theory, and they were looking around for some other points on the island that would back his theory up. Um, but again, we haven't heard much about it since then. So I, I'm not sure uh, just where this lays out, but they were using uh, not only uh, Nolan's cross um, as a marker, as a as a way, but they're also looking at, you know, some of those lines, um, you know, that you see going off over Isaac's point there on the far right and actually leads out to another little island. So the end of it actually went out to where there's another little island out there. And I've forgotten the name of it now. Um, that they like did Apple well, Island or something. Yeah, yeah, that might be it. Apple Island. Yeah. So they went out. And they actually looked around a little bit. They didn't find anything definitive. So they came back and kind of threw in the towel on it. Um, but does that mean that there's not something that could be on that other island? I mean, maybe they're looking in the wrong place the whole time. There's been th people that have said the money pit is nothing more than a ruse to make you dig here and spend all your time and money and effort digging here and to find nothing when the treasure really is somewhere else. Plus the money pit. Yeah, so that, yeah, yeah. Hence the word money pit, because you spend all your money trying to find it. You never will because it's not there. So there's always been that that talk, um, you know, that that going on. So, you know, I, I'm one of these people that think the the eye of the swamp might be more significant to be. I want them to dig it up, get in there with a case on, put put uh, put uh, the. Uh, um, Oh, I'm trying to think of the, the sheet metal where you go in and, and drive the, um, the, the, the coffer dam. That's what it is. You put a coffer dam around that eye of the swamp and dig that baby up. So this one here, Travis did do a great presentation on it, but I, I don't think they found anything to really back it up. And hence, we haven't heard about it much since then. Um, but it is a good, it is a good, you know, whenever somebody comes up with a decent theory like this, you have to check it out. I mean, you can't just let it go without looking into it for sure. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ian, you want to continue? We can do uh, some uh, the Knights nice Templar theory as well. Yeah, let's let's do like I, one more, and then if we can do maybe a part two because um, yeah, I really do need to get going. Sure, thanks. Yeah, no, this I one, just definitely want to get into the Templars, and uh, that can be the no, last yeah. one for today. Are you sure you don't want to do it? Uh, Templar is a big one for you. We can try to cover it briefly. <laughs> Or at least start <laughs> yeah. to. The Templar is really going to be one that goes on for. That is a big right, one, right? That is. A big yeah. One. So uh, yeah, that's what, yeah. I let me, let me just say that I, I do, uh, uh, and we talked about that in the show that I just finished um, with uh, Christopher uh, Morford and Corian Mole. Um, we did talk a little bit about the Templars in that one, and um, I'm, I'm a believer that the Templars, when they escaped, uh, when they when they had Friday the Thirteenth, we all know about the story of Friday the Thirteenth, right? Um, Friday the 13th in 1307, when the King of France went after him to take them down because uh, he wanted, for one, they were getting too big uh, and he was a little bit afraid of them, um, but also because um, he uh, he wanted their wealth. He owed them a lot of money and he thought, man, if I could just you know take them down and get that, all that treasure back, uh, that they, they all the wealth back that they have, I'll be sitting pretty. So they, they and, and again, this is one of those things where I'm making up a little bit of my own uh, theory into this, but um, they, I think they made up the story of them uh, starting to give, go away. That they were initially the Templars were the Knights of Christ, right? So they were doing. They went to work uh, to help the pilgrims get to the Holy Land, and they were doing this for the Pope. Um, and they were very religious based. They believed in uh, Jesus and they uh, and God, and uh, so they were working. They they were Knights of you know they were Knights of Christ. So. They were they, to to bring them down. They had to spread uh, information saying that these guys have varied away from that. They they're starting to do these. Uh, they're you know they become heretics. They're starting to do these rituals and stuff that don't have anything. They're they're going towards the devil rather than towards Christ. So that's that's what they use to bring them down. To use their justification and bringing them down. 
Um, and so when they did this, they, they did capture a lot of them, but they didn't get much wealth. And they're wondering what happened to it. Well, they know that there was a 17, there was talk about 17 ships that were standing by. Cause you know, if all this stuff was happening, that the, the story is that um, you're going to know about it. When, when, when the rumblings are happening with the King and his, uh, uh, in his palace and everything, that when he's starting to work on this, you know that the story is going to get leaked back to the leaders of the Templars. That, uh, okay, something's happening. And so you're going to start gathering your wealth. You're going to start moving things into strategic locations and, and prepare to go somewhere. So we know that they had like 17 ships standing by. Uh, when all when all heck broke loose and they took off, they jumped on these ships and they headed up into Scotland. Uh, Scotland was neutral at the time uh, and didn't follow what the uh, the king was talking about or you know, going that direction. So they went up to Scotland. Now, where they went from there, we don't know. The theory is that they came over to the New World. They came over to North America um, and they brought their treasure. Now, would you keep all your treasure in one place? No, you'd probably spread it around a little bit. But uh, So the theory is that they brought it to uh, North America. So... Right. Yeah, so we and we we should we should probably hold this for part two and then do a part two and talk about because that's that's on. what I'm thinking for sure. <laughs> I didn't realize uh, we'd take up so much time, but uh, I'd definitely yeah, be willing so to really, do a, yeah. a part two if you'd be willing to do that with us. Oh sure, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, because yeah, there's so tons of stuff we can get into. I know, I know, and there's so many different theories and and like that you get into the Templars and uh, um, that's such a, a huge subject in itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, so I'm looking at some of the pictures you brought up here, and these are looks like that one is the uh, the stone, the one on the bottom the left. There is stone got, and then the, the H.O. stone there for sure, and then the cross. Uh, that's on the um, starts with the P. I have to look that up. And now that I've like seen that the, picture, you're gonna... the glue's cap head, right? They, uh, they, yes, yes. They yes. went off to like mainland Nova Scotia, and they they found mm -hmm. the, the the stone head, and then yeah, I and believe that name, this and name, and I can't remember what it is. Yeah. And then I believe that that carving and the the corn were on the same stone. Yep, yep, yeah. So we got some interesting stuff we can certainly talk about there. Yeah, it's very tempting. <laughs> we're <laughs> running low on time. Yep. So well, yeah, if we, if we could wrap it up and then uh, I'll get on my way and we'll uh, we'll do a part two if you want. Yeah, for sure. That'd be all over all right. that. And uh, all right. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. And I, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Jeff, thank you for being able to come on and talk about all these theories with us today. All right. Well, thanks for and, having uh, me. I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll definitely do this some more. And uh, look forward to a part two where we can continue talking about all these theories and uh, specifically the Templars. Because like, like we said, there's a lot we can get into. So uh, we'll, we'll save that for a separate episode. But uh, Sounds good. Yeah, thanks to everybody who uh, was watching or listening to this episode, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. All right.